great pleasure to um, introduce uh, David Berliner, otherwise known as David Berliner. Uh, he comes from very far away, Belgium. Uh, David is a um, professor in the uh, uh, Department of uh, anthropology and Sociology at uh, Université Libre de Bruxelles, uh, Free University of Brussels. And he has um, uh, been there uh, for a number of years, did his PhD there, uh, uh, and most of his career has been in, at the Free University of Brussels, except for a year which he spent as assistant professor at the Central, University, Central European University in Budapest. Um, uh, David has conducted field work, as anthropologists do, in uh, various parts of uh, the world, uh, besides Brussels and Amsterdam, uh, and that includes Burkina Faso, uh, Guinea, Gabon, and more recently Laos, which is uh, what he'll be presenting, uh, uh, um, the results of which he'll be presenting to us uh, today. Um, his publication is actually uh, quite... Uh, uh, lengthy, and he has, uh, uh, going backwards, a book in press, uh, I'm sorry, uh, under review right now uh, with a publisher in Geneva, which is called Baga Memories. Um, uh, then he has uh, a special issue of the French journal Terrain as editor. Terrain is quite an important French uh, anthropological and sociological um, uh, journal. He has um, a co-edited co collection on uh, the uh, institution, the UNESCO, um, and a special issue of the journal Civilisation, which is called Sexualities um, uh, Apprentissage. Uh, huh? Learning and performance. Learning, yeah. I was going to say training, but sexuality and training doesn't quite go. Learning and performance. Um, and another co-edited journal called Speaking of Women, Men Doing Anthropology of, uh, Men Doing Anthropology of Women, and that's a special issue of the journal Men and Masculinities. And finally, uh, co -edited, another co-edited book called Learning Religion, Anthropological Approaches, uh, published by Berghahn Books. Uh, a number of journals as well in Anthropological Quarterly, Men Masculinity, American Ethnologist, uh, Anthropological Quarterly, all of which is extremely impressive. The topics include uh, nostalgia and memory, um, uh, religion, uh, read de passage, um, uh, uh, the emergence of ethnicity, um, uh, youth, uh, and of course, gender and sexuality. Without further ado, I welcome David. Thank you very much for coming. Oh, I have to wear that, thank you very much. I can put it here, and should I, should I keep it uh, here? Yeah. Um, yeah. I've never used it. Yeah. All right. All right. Thank you very much, Nico, for your really kind invitation. Also, thank you very much to your center, uh, Gender and Sexuality Center at University of Amsterdam. It's really a great pleasure to be here listening to your very kind presentation. I was wondering whether I have any consistency. And I feel like a little bit like a, I have so many interests in the discipline that I feel that I'm always attracted by so many different issues. Uh, but um, uh, clearly, I have to start my, my talk today by emphasizing the fact that uh, what I will be presenting is, is still very fragmentary. It's still a work in progress. And uh, it's a research I've started in 2007 in Luang Prabang, northern city of, um, uh, city of northern Laos. And so I'm very eager to get any feedback and comments on, on what I'll be presenting today. And indeed, it, it will be only a very uh, partial glimpse into uh, a very rich and complex terrain of uh, sexual terrain in, in Luang Prabang. Clearly, more research is needed. Uh, in the future, so I'm really eager to get your, your feedback. Uh, but let me start with an anecdote, uh, uh, an anecdote, a short anecdote telling about how I got interested in those, those issues uh, and issues of sexuality in Luang Prabang. And uh, I had been in Luang Prabang for, for two weeks and I 
I was driven to Nong Prabang because I was interested in UNESCO issues and I wanted to understand the process of UNESCOization of this city of northern Laos and heritage making issues. And I was eating in a restaurant uh, alone at night uh, after two weeks in, in the city. And the restaurant was held by two Katoi. Uh, Katoi is a word, I'm sure you, most of you know what it, what it means, but in, in in the largest sense of the term in Laos, uh, Katoi means any man sleeping with a man, but in a restricted sense of the word, it means those uh, female to men transgendered individuals um, who sleep with men. And uh, in that case, I mean, uh, the two Katoi I met in this restaurant were in men sleeping with men, but not effeminate uh, men sleeping uh, um, uh, transgendered individuals. And when I joined the cashier to pay the bill, they started asking me, asking me questions. What's your name? Do you work here? Are you married or lonely? Do you like boys? Clumsily, I did answer, I'm not into boys but girls. One of them smiled and exclaimed to me, I can be the woman if you like. I turned red and I left the place immediately. Two days later, I'm sitting alone in the Kop Chai bar, which is the only officially gay bar in Laos. And the same two guys enter the bar. They stare at me, they laugh at me, and me being embarrassed. And ironically, they say to me, are you sure you, are li you like girl girls only? Because of course I was sitting in the in, in only officially gay bar of Luang Prabang and of Laos. And that's exactly this side of uh, Luang Prabang I want to explore with you today. Because Luang Prabang is a religious city, it's, uh, it has been listed as a World Heritage uh, Site since uh, 1995, and on the one hand it represents this typical patrimonial heterotopia. However, in the mirror of the UNESCO sanctuary, there is another town which coexists with it, and this other Luang Prabang is turned by some of its, uh, some of its expatriates, the gay paradise, and it stands in an intrinsically ambiguous relationship with the tone of heritage preservation, temples, and monks. And in, in my today presentation, uh, I suggest that one looks at two aspects uh, which are rarely associated in anthropological literature. On the one hand, in, on the one hand heritage making and uh, issues of sexuality. And I, I will try to, to show in my paper that uh, such heritage scape, Luang Prabang, is also um, a sexualized space. Okay, let me now turn, introduce you to, to the site where I've conducted uh, research to, to Luang Prabang, which is located uh, 300 kilometers from uh, Vientiane uh, to the north, Luang Prabang, in northern Laos. And it's a city famous for its 34 Buddhist monks and orange-robed, um, no, sorry, 34 Buddhist monasteries and orange-robed monks, as well as for its colonial architecture. Luang Prabang is an ancient royal town of Laos. Its history is punctuated by the succession of kings from the 14th century. From the 15th century, Luang Prabang has seen successive invasions by foreign powers, the Vietnamese, the Burmese, the Siamese, the Chinese, and finally the French, who after having signed an agreement with the reigning king, invented the national borders of Laos and established a protectorate which persisted until 1953. In the 50s and the 60s, the development of Lao People's Revolutionary Party led to the 1975 Socialist Revolution and the dethronement of the king, which forced into exile many residents of the town, regarded as possible supporters of the king. In 1995, after a long decision-making process involving Lao and French actors, the UNESCO Assembly inscribed Luang Prabang on its World Heritage List at the Berlin Conference. You can see a very a nice view of, of the city. Conservation policies mainly focus on the inventory of traditional and colonial houses, temples, and natural and aquatic spaces. These protected areas are carefully monitored via la Maison du Patrimoine, Heritage House, a Lao institution composed of a mixture of Lao architects and foreign experts, mostly French, through which UNESCO Paris preservation policies are implemented. Above all, Heritage House, la Maison du Patrimoine, strives to preserve and restore pre-World War II religious and ordinary listed monuments in town. And these are the kind of houses, houses uh, wooden houses on stilts, which are 
listed, uh, called traditional low houses, and also those kind of houses, uh, uh, which are called colonial houses, and being built, having been built uh, during the colonial time uh, of uh, Indochina, and also those magnificent temples, Buddhist temples, which are uh, internationally recognized. Since its UNESCO recognition, Luang Prabang has become a key destination for tourists in Southeast Asia. And this is a very nice uh, sunset on one of the top, uh, one of the <laughs> hill of Luang Prabang. According to local statistics provided by tourism office, it attracted uh, 260,000 tourists in 2005, a boom in comparison with the 62,000 of 97. Whether they are experts or tourists, Luang Prabang represents for most Western foreigners a very fragile site, threatened by modernity, any need for being urgently preserved from destruction. In particular, they emphasize the threat of losing the spirit of the place, l'esprit du lieu, a mixture of Western romanticized perception of Buddhism and colonial conception of other people's traditional life, conveying nostalgia for local spectral ritual, for a feeling of quietness and isolation under the tropics, and for autochthonous people living their traditional life in their traditional houses and temples. While Foucault considers that gardens, cemeteries, brothels, jails, and holiday camps are heterotopic spaces, I suggest that heritage cities hold the same qualities. Luang Prabang, a heritage town, constitutes the perfect example of patrimonial heterotopia, symptom of a need to, and I quote Foucault, accumulate everything to constitute the general archive of a culture. End of quote a place of all times that is itself outside of time. In Luang Prabang, UNESCO architects uh, are building another real space, a space protected from globalizing forces where what one sees as the irreversible flow of time could somehow be controlled. Fashioning a world outside of the turbulences of contemporary world, Luang Prabang town center looks neat and meticulously organized, like many colonial cities. It represents what Foucault labels a heterotopia of compensation, a real space committed to organized arrangements of things, compensating for what many of us see today as a messy, globalized, and disordered world. Atoning a fear for cultural loss that many educated Westerners and Asians, whether they are experts or tourists, do share today. A real space, not conserved as such, but in fact a new territory, reinvented by UNESCO experts, with UNESCO signs and posters marking everywhere the urban texture. And if you walk in the city center, you'll find many posters and signs from UNESCO. You should, you know, respect the law, you shouldn't smoke, and everything is there to remind you that you are posing your feet in a sanctuary preserved uh, from destruction by, by UNESCO. Whilst for most Western experts and tourists, Luang Prabang represents a tone of tradition, for most Lao, it also symbolizes the material legacy of Lao glorious past culture and history, although contested, and a national religious center. But for most Lao, tradition holds very different connotations. In particular, women's behaviors constitute the lens through which the passing of time and the persistence of tradition are evaluated. In Luang Prabang, says this old man, women are the most traditional. Here, we respect the tradition, whilst in Vientiane, the capital, it's disappearing. Throughout the country, Luang Pramangi's women are reputedly the most respectful of, of tradition, in comparison with those in Vientiane, but also with female tourists, Americans and Japanese, whose postures, attitudes and clothing are judged totally indecent, and whose sexuality is seen as unleashed, as, and I quote, they come here to sleep with monks, end of quote, sleeping with monks being a trope often used to capture the changes happening in town, as I will show later in my presentation. Such discourses about women's behaviors take place within the Lao sex gender system, which connects female bodies and the respect of traditions, a perspective the government has campaigned on since the 1975 date of the socialist revolution. Some Luang Pramangis do indeed remember a time when before 1975, women wore miniskirts and were dressed like Americans. Since the revolution, the government has promulgated official decisions about the sin this piece of silk used by women as a skirt and described as the traditional cloth of Lao woman and forcing women to wear it when they go to temples, local administration and schools for ideological as well as economic reasons as the Lao government had imposed strict controls on most imports, including clothing. 
and this is the the scene. So this is this uh, this skirt um, you can see on the picture. In Rapta Bank, this piece of clothing is the most visible part of a very strict code of femininity which imposes on women to speak discreetly, to act with carefulness, to take care of the household, to never manifest any sexual desire, and also to remain virgin until marriage. Although some women are said to be lost as they wear pants, cut their hair, go out clubbing alone, date Westerners, and enjoy sex, and one hears stories about girls having se sex before marriage and abortive practices effectuated se in secret, a normal female spatiality hovers between the market in the morning, home or at work during the day, and watching television with her husband or the family at night, rumor being a very, poor social, uh, very powerful social weapon in Rampabang. Such a contrived spatiality is well captured by a local saying which emphasizes that women's steps are very narrow in Luang Prabang. In this regard, the annual organization of Miss Luang Prabang constitutes the epitome of such hegemonic femininity within the public space. And this beauty contest is indeed highly revealing of the connection existing between femininity and the respect of religious traditions, as the winner, followed by its six dauphins, will reenact the mythical scenario of Panga Kabilopom, which is a very famous legendary figure in the history of Lomprabang. During the religious procession, which circulates in the town center during Lao New Year, they will proudly sit on a float and will spill water on the most respected Buddhas in town. A mythical scenario reenacted every year, it is also a public dramatization of the local forms of female beauty, an eminently moral beauty, as contestants, beside their the big black eyes, long hair, and very white skin, must be virgins and born from a highly respected family. And so this is the, the selection of the, of, the, of the Miss. And at the end of the selection process, there is a three days uh, show during which Miss Luang Prabang will be elected with its uh, six uh, dauphins. Um, you have here, I don't know if you can see clearly, but Miss Luang Prabang is, the, is at the center and she's uh, surrounded by the dauphins. And during the New Year's parade, she will sit on the float and circulates in the, in the city center. Interestingly, most of my interlocutors in Lamprabang mentioned that she looked so much like a former, an old princess uh, from the royal time and that she had really the very nice uh, uh, face of a, of a Lamprabangese princess. In such gendered regime, men are considered as freer in their spatiality and sexuality. Whilst for girls, marriage is in theory the condition to sex, for young men it says that they have a stronger sexual desire, attention, which will be most of the time secretly released with prostitutes, whether they are male or female, in brothels, guest houses, or in the bathroom of restaurants, all heterotopic spaces par excellence. In brief, whilst many tourists see in Lamprabang a charming little town set among lush mountains with its French influence and its Buddhist mystique, Luang Prabang also constitutes a site locked up by tradition and heteronormative nationalism centered on family and marriage. Local women's associations, monks, school teachers, political leaders, and parents exert a very strict police on men and women's behaviors. It, interestingly, some of my interlocutors also emphasize that UNESCO not only contributes to monument preservation, but also to gender conservation. Like this man exclaiming to me that UNESCO and I quote, UNESCO is very good because we keep the old things. For instance, women who go to the temple, they have to wear the sin, this piece of uh, clothing. Thanks to UNESCO, women keep doing that. Otherwise, they would wear pants in temple. UNESCO helps us to preserve our traditions. And clearly in that matter, UNESCO can surely reinforce traditions in ways it doesn't expect. Needless to say that any expression of sexuality outside such patriarchal heterosexuality is unwelcome. Luang Prabang is not a social environment uh, celebrating sexual diversity. However, whilst relationships between men and women are severely controlled, women being reputedly very arrogant and, in in and inaccessible here, and I quote, men-to-men -men sexual encounters are practic practically much easier, at least if they remain secret and invisible. Indeed, among the unexpected effects of UNESCO recognition and the touristic boom, Luang Prabang is described by some of its inhabitants and its tourists as a town which becomes gay. Surely the gayest place on earth, states one tourist on the net. 
As another right on a gay forum, for a start, the, the tourist population in Lampavang seems to be extremely gay. Everywhere you looked, there were gay men, usually middle-aged, usually in couples. There is indeed another Luang Prabang, the gay paradise, an expression used by many expatriates, seen as indecent by most locals, and which represents the other facet of the tone of tradition, monks and pure women. It's a fragmented gay landscape, inhabited by diverse categories of men sleeping with other men, and which deploys itself at night in the intimacy of tourist bars at local expats, but also in university dorms, university or factory dorms, in guest houses. One knows that uh, Gay can be a tricky word when describing men-to-men -men forms of interaction around the globe. Although the category itself is circulated in Luang Prabang, one is still far from the political expression of gay politics like in Thailand. In Luang Prabang, the landscape of men sleeping with men is complex. From the overtly effeminate Katoi, or the newly self-recognized and educated gay, to these men, married men, who occasionally sleep with other men, but who never declare that they are gay, nor identify with Katoi. That's such complexity that I want to tackle now. First, although men have slept with men in Laos long before the advent of tourism and heritage making, Luang Prabang constitutes nowadays a sexual heterotopia for many gay expatriates, Westerners and Asians, who have settled down uh, in, in Luang Prabang. In fact, I've discovered that many businesses are held by gays from abroad, French, Belgians, Germans, Brits, Australians or Dutch, some of them being in couple with Lao men, and who for most don't mix with a gay tourist. In town, there are approximately 15 gay couples and two lesbian couples who own most of the restaurants, bars, spas, travel agencies, and other ethnic handicraft shops. Among expats, I've heard the expression, everyone, everyone is gay in Rampabang so many times during my stay. As emphasized by one of them, among expats, there are more homos than heterosexuals. We, heterosexuals, are only few. In fact, whether they are gay or not, expatriates, among 150 individuals, spend their time gossiping about each other's sexual identity, about who's gay and who is not. Interestingly, many describe Luang Prabang as a lieu de passage where sexual identities are shifting and sometimes transformed. Like, and I quote, this guy who when he arrived here, he was hetero, and then he was seen with guys. Everyone becomes gay in Luang Prabang, end of quote. While gay expatriates are numerous in town in Luang Prabang, there are also many Katoi's in town. In Laos, Katoi is a word to refer to any man sleeping, sleeping with another man. In the narrow sense of the term, it indexes the effeminate homosexual men, ladyboys, who dress like women and have a woman's heart in a man's body. And I've here some pictures. Rarely operated, although some do gather money to go to Thailand and get surgery, Katoi represent for most Lao the structural opposite of Lao femininity. They are described as Jai Hon, agitated, noisy, shameless, loquacious, exhibitionist, wealthy, cheaters, as being starving for sex and engaging themselves into sexual transactions with locals, expatriates, and tourists. Effeminate transvestites are no, now around 30 in Luang Prabang. Remarkably, they occupy, they occupy a very visible position in Luang Prabangi society by virtue of their dress and, and behavior, and also in some traditional performances like this one on the picture, um, when they proudly walk in the New Year's Parade or compete with their own boat during the boat racing festival, two crucial moments of Luang Prabang patrimonial consecration. And interestingly, most Lao are tolerant of such visible presence in the traditional events in a society which nevertheless doesn't celebrate gay identity and where homosexual encounters must remain secret and invisible. And one option, and that's the option that I will defend in the conclusion of my talk, one option would be to think that Katoi don't represent such transgressive behavior and practices for most locals, as long as they remain in a sphere which is seen as acceptable for them, like sex workers or hairdressers. But I'll come back to that in the conclusion of my talk. In the complex texture of the town, the Kop Chai Bar is a gay spot, described as such in most touristic guides, although such description is forbidden by Lao authorities, which never sell Luang Prabang as a gay destination. And so this is another picture of, of Katoi during the parade, of, of the New Year's parade. I'll show you the, 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 the movie right after. And this is the Kop Chai Bar. Uh, uh, 
which is never sold as a, a good spot. Um, at night, many caterers do gather there, waiting for clients, mostly for tourists. Most gay expatriates tend to avoid it. Also, one of the two clubs in town, called the Dao Fa, is a reputed gay hangout. And this is a picture of the, of the Dao Fa nightclub. A uh, uh, heterotropic site, the Dao Fa is made of a mixture of caterers, Lao gays, gay tourists, gay expatriates, but also cohorts of American tourists, heterosexual Lao students, French backpackers, an anthropologist, or Asian businessmen looking for a, pr a prostitute. Following Foucault, the Dao Fa constitutes a space setting up, and I quote Foucault, unsettling juxtapositions of incommensurate objects, where invisible frontiers separate many categories of actors, but still occupying the same space. Last but not least, the bowling, and here's the bowling, uh, is another heterotopic, et heterotopic space in town, open until 2 a.m., while nightclubs and bars close at 11.30 because of the national curfew, which gather together diverse people with different interests and desires, a pickup scene for gay tourists and caterers, but also a drinking place for heterosexual backpackers. On site, these places are never publicly advertised as gay, but most knowledge circulates through internet, tourist guidebooks, and informal discussions in town. Most gay tourists meet up in the Gopchai bar and at the nightclub Dao Fa. Since its UNESCO recognition, Luang Prabang has indeed become an important gay destination in Southeast Asia. Based on my interviews with tourists, such tourism is not only driven by sexual consumption, but also by the desire to visit a gay-friendly town where one can feel comfortable with, with one, one's own sexual identity. Purple Dragon, a travel agency based in Bangkok, organizes tours in town with a gay guide and will make you discover the gay Luang Prabang. On the internet, there are also many forums like Asia Utopia, where Luang Prabang is explicitly described as a gay-friendly city, where, and I quote, you'll find lots of cute local guys and some gays. Restaurants are labeled gay-friendly hangouts with, I quote, uh, handsome and charming waiters. Chats and posts for same-sex hookup in town are also abundant on the net. American, Australian, French, or Thai gay tourists wander around the Kop Chai Bar, the Dao Fa nightclub, as well as gay-friendly restaurants, massage centers, and saunas, where they meet up with uh, Lao men, contributing to the transformation of the city into a sexcape, to use Dennis Brennan's expression, a site inextricably tied up with uh, transactional sex, an ocean borrowed uh, from Apadurai to describe the fluidity and the irregular forms of this sexual landscape. This is my third visit here, a gay Thai tourist says. I love the quaint, small town atmosphere. The place is beautiful and the people are so kind and hospitable. I particularly love the young men here. They are so cute. Whilst not being a feminine transvestite, nor identifying themselves as gay, many young men from Luang Prabang and the countryside, in particular those who work in the bars, restaurants and massage centers, do take part in two sexual transactions with gay expatriates and tourists. Since 1995, according to my interlocutors, masculine prostitution between Lao and Westerners is on the rise in Luang Prabang, a prostitution which has its own spaces and times in the heritage area. A room in a guest house, the bathroom of a restaurant, a massage center, a sauna, or the first floor of the Kop Chai bar. At night, after 10 p.m., or early in the morning, before 5 a.m., before the monks starts uh, uh, Takbat, which is the, the well-known mor morning almsgiving ritual during which inhabitants will give food to their monks and monks in exchange will pray for them. Um, so before Takbat, uh, uh, Luang Prabang geography is, is very different and, and at night the geography changes radically. When most Lao are sleeping, you'll see foreigners and Lao locals walking in the dark and looking for each other. It's as if the daylight spatiality, which articulates everyday life, religious duties, and patrimonial consecration, is at night substituted with another. The spatiality of male hookup, whose scenario is repeating itself inexorably, with always the same set of questions. What's your name? Do you work here? Are you married? Do you like boys? A sexual heterotopia for gay expatriates and tourists who see in it a, a pickup scene, 
Luang Prabang reminded me of the eroticization of Asian colonial spaces, which have constituted since European colonizers' potential sexual counter worlds. Whilst most Westerners fall for the Indochina spirit of Luang Prabang, which plunges them into an idealized past world reminiscent of Marguerite Duras' book L'Amant, the Indochina spirit, with its old cars, fans, furniture, and colors, which is constantly reinforced by UNESCO experts, tourist companies, restaurants, and hotel owners. So this is also Luang Prabang. It's, it's a patrimonial heterotopia which reactivate uh, eternal fantasmatic Indochina with those old cars. The Indochina spirit is everywhere. But uh, 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 the other facet of the, 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 uh, the fantasmatic Indochina is also uh, uh, the town representing an enchanting eroticized space where you do things you never do in Europe, claims a gay tourist met in a cafe and speak about, about orgies in town. As one French expat underlines, here men are so hot. With their wives, you know, they don't do anything. You know, here your work, wife, you fuck her less possibly. But with Westerners, young men are unleashed, especially in Luang Prabang. Here you fuck first and then you talk. In contrast with the sleepy Luang Prabang and its most traditional women of the nation stands the gay paradise with the hottest boys in the country. A hot topic of discussion for tourists and locals alike, monks too are mobilized in such process of eroticization. Some tourists are prone to joke about monk sexual naughtiness, like this one who says that there are a few naughty monks here. On occasion, a boy with a shaved head can be seen in normal clothes, at a disco with his non-novice friends, or a novice will have obscene photos of girls on his phone. Some novices even told me about watching obscene videos on the TV in the temple after the abbot has gone to sleep. Such sexualization of abstinent monks has also its share in the gay paradise. In a hotel magazine for Southeast Asia, which, is, uh, which I found in Luang Prabang, and which, it, it, it is anonymous, but it was probably written by a foreign tour operator, uh, there is a very interesting uh, um, allusion to this process of, of eroticization, but in, in, in the gay paradise. It's gay eroticization at work. Eroticization of the most respected religious ritual in town, Takbat, the morning uh, almsgiving ritual, which is uh, transformed into uh, uh, a queer performance of these naughty monks. And I let you read uh, the, what the brochure says. Luang Prabang even has three gay bars, which intrigued me. Why does a tiny town in the deep north of Laos have three gay bars? The answer turned to be those naughty monks. Between midnight and 6 a.m., quite a few of them dump the saffron robes and sneak out for some clubbing and sneak back for their 6 a.m. ritual of collecting arms. Knowing this certainly puts a different spin on the early morning parade. As they file by, one by one, you can't help but wonder, does he or doesn't he? In such depiction, the two incompatible facets of Luang Prabang, tone of abstinent monks and gay paradise are entangled. A certainly shocking and unacceptable perspective for most inhabitants who are nonetheless likely to be very critical with their monks' behaviors too, as I will show now. Actually, I need some water. Okay. I'm not going too fast. You, you don't sleep yet? Alors, the next section is, is entitled UNESCO Sex and Drug, a paradise for whom? Uh, whilst for some, Luang Prabang symbolizes a gay paradise with its naughty monks, most locals have nevertheless discrepant perspectives on such development. Luang Prabangis are very critical vis-à-vis -vis the contemporary proliferation of relationship between men, although such proliferation is impossible to quantify, and they see it as a side effect of the rapid changes which have affected the town since its UNESCO recognition in 1995. As emphasized by this Lao woman, and I quote, there are only faggots here, mostly Westerners. There is, there is even a gay neighborhood now. Some are transvestites, and they dance in the street on Saturday evenings. End of quote. Contrary to the myth of sexual tolerance in Southeast Asia, which is generally depicted as a region whose people are tolerant of homosexuality, 
such proliferation is seen as shocking and indecent for many long Romanese. As one gay guy living in town puts it, acceptance is not tolerance, Lao people are very homophobic, but they are not violent. Katoi are usually described as talok by locals, a word which means funny, something that makes one laugh, but which nevertheless conveys a strong sense of stigmatization. Indeed, whilst most inhabitants emphasize how their life has positively changed over the last 20 years, all are very proud to see that their town is now an internationally recognized site where tourists come from all over the world and bring a lot of money. Drug smuggling and masculine prostitution are the most often mentioned negative impact of UNESCOization and tourism development. Monks are, for instance, at the heart of rumors circulated by locals. Some locals index their implication in drug smuggling with tourists, as one says that 90 monks have been jailed for drug trafficking. Others gossip about the hookups with female tourists, the culpability being on the side of these Japanese and American tourists who tease innocent monks. As a matter of fact, monks who are expected to be abstinent uh, have been recently tested for AIDS and the syphilis. For many, monks' behaviors have become a metaphor to efficiently apprehend changes which have an effect on the tones in its UNESCO recognition. As for masculine prostitution, most locals do hold Westerners responsible for bringing it with them. As underlined by this young Lao man, Katoi come with Westerners. You are the ones who like Katoi, so they followed you. Another says that to sleep with the Westerners brings money for the whole family. Thus, very often parents accept that their son date a foreigner. Katoi are rich here. I've heard so many times from Pramangis emphasizing, emphasizing that men are worth gold here, to refer to masculine prostitution with Westerners as a survival strategy for many young men in town. For some, these fears take the form of post-colonial imagination. Whilst, as I've said at the beginning of my talk, some people do celebrate UNESCO's role in gender conservation, I've also heard many others accusing UNESCO and the French of transforming Luan Prabang into an arena for male prostitution. The responsible claim this old uh, woman, it's heritage making, UNESCO. Before there were only two or three categories here, but now there are plenty. When he worked in town, the former director of UNESCO brought all his gay friends along. That's why there are so many categories here. All the people working for heritage are gay. More generally, Western uh, tourist and expatriates' behaviors in town is often pinpointed by locals as the cause of cultural decay. For this woman, Lao woman, Westerners don't behave well here. They say they come here to help us to preserve our traditions and heritage, but they destroy our culture by behaving badly, in particular the French working at UNESCO. With all these categories, this is again Lao tradition, end of quote. Many, many educated Lao also put a clear emphasis on the colonial uh, no, many educators, sorry, put emphasis uh, on the colonial posture of France in the uh, UNESCOization of their city, but, they also, uh, on the, but also on the rising and detrimental influence of Thai culture, which, through television, renders acceptable and even desirable Katoi Kata style of life. Most Katoi are indeed accused of coming from abroad, mostly Thailand. We didn't have that before, but now they all come from Thailand and they, came, they come because of tourists. Following a typical rhetoric about the foreign origin of homosexuality, the gay paradise is everything but Lao. It is Western, it is Thai, but it's not Lao. And above all, it's not a gay paradise, it's a prostitutional arena. Local discourses tend to associate post-colonialism, heritage making, and visible homosexuality. However, such discourses obfuscate the long history of men-to-men -man casual encounters in Lao, a society where it's easier to sleep with a man than a woman. Whilst in some ways, Luang Prabang nowadays looks like this bordel de l'Europe denounced by Fanon, a sexual heterotopia for gay tourists and expatriates, there are also many men in town who, without being transgendered, no gays, sleep secretly with other men. According to Chris Littleton, an anthropologist, uh, for, uh, Australian anthropologist, who has just published a fascinating study about the, the subject in 2008, in Vientiane, one man in five admits that he has slept with another man once in his life. In Luang Prabang, Littleton writes, 100 to 150 individuals would overtly define themselves as gay or Katoi. Far from being the gay paradise of the expatriates, these men don't meet up in nightclubs, nor in the gay bars of the city, 
but rather in university and factories, dormitories, restaurants in the countryside, or military caserns, which constitute crucial sites for sexual learning and pleasure. But unfortunately, this is the part, this is clearly the most secretive and invisible part of my research, and, and clearly I need to conduct more research in, in, uh, to better identify this terrain of the, uh, I mean, local men sleeping with local men, and there is such sexual silence uh, around, around that that, uh, uh, um, and it's, I mean, it's so difficult to investigate as a, as a foreigner that that's my aim for my next uh, field trip during the, during the summer. Okay, let me now turn to my conclusions already. I've been very fast, I think. Okay. Uh, <laughs> All right. Uh, at first, I've discovered in Wampabang a fascinating example of coexistence of a heritage town, a gay sexcape, and a prostitutional arena. And there is so much pressure on the urban texture to become a patrimonial heterotopia that I almost found amusing to observe the parallel development of the gay haven. And we can also discuss that in the, in, in the discussion, but Luan Prabang is not alone in this situation. Uh, an article was written last year in the, in the New York Times uh, about Angkor in Cambodia as also becoming a gay haven uh, for local gays and also gay expatriates. But things are more complex than this, this somehow anecdotal observation. A disappearing vestige of humanity for developers, an Indochinese Oxford for Western tourists, a downtown for some of its inhabitants, a great place to invest in for others, a religious center for Lao and Thai visitors, and a gay subscape for tourists and expatriates. Luang Prabang represents a hybrid which deploys an intricate scene under our anthropologist's eyes. In that regard, it shows how such heritage scapes, caught in the dilemmas of modernity, tourism, and nostalgia, can be variously experienced by different groups of often disconnected people. And that's also the case for Luang Prabang as a sexual terrain. A heteronormative space locked up by tradition where gays are not welcome. A gay paradise for expatriates and tourists. A place to make a living for Katoi. Or a prostitutional arena for many young locals. Everyone seems to engage with the sexual world of their own. With their own desires, prohibitions and influences. But whilst the paradise seems to be the promise for gay tourists and expatriates of becoming, uh, and I quote here Murray, the flag bearer of a progressive, socially visible gay identity connected to enlightened democratic nation states, end of quote, for many uh, young Lao men who one day have a girlfriend, the other sleep with a kateri, and occasionally, occasionally sorry, get some cash or cell phone for a night with, with a Westerner, the core issue is that of invisibility. As I've heard many times in the field, if it's invisible, then it is acceptable. A very different epistemology than the one coming out of the closet. As Dils Lao Gay, uh, gay from Luang Prabang puts it, I want to do business here, so I have to hide the fact that I'm gay, otherwise I would never be accepted as a businessman. End of quote. In such regime, acceptability does rely on the existence of separate spheres in which a behavior is seen as acceptable or not. Transgendered individuals like Katoi are publicly visible as long as they remain in the sphere to which they are assigned, sex workers, hairdressers, talok, funny, and agitated people, even when they take part in two patrimonial uh, events in town. But the sentence, Katoi should never be in politics, ever, uttered by one of my Lao friends in Luang Prabang, is revealing of the social conditions for such acceptability. Contrarily to what might think, Katoi don't represent the epitome of transgressive behaviors, or contrary to what I might think, Katoi uh, uh, do not represent the epitome of transgressive behaviors and practices. Rather, in contemporary laws, they expose at the most a specific sex gender system based on the existence of multiple distinct social spheres which have their own criteria of belonging. And moving in, in between these spheres requires a great deal of invisibility. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, David, for a tremendous talk. Um, Tremendous. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, which uh, touches on a host of uh, uh, questions that are about sexuality, but lots of other things. Um, so, uh, let's yeah, I'm, I will take a pen so I can write down your, your questions. Thank you very much. Who let you begin? 
What do you mean? Eight. Eight policies? Uh, I mean, there is, of course, there are many NGOs working in, I mean, in, in Lampre Bang, but I mean, uh, as many things in, in Lampre Bang, everything comes f with NGOs and foreigners and Japanese support and uh, Thailand feeding and giving. Do you understand my accent? <laughs> I can I, I cannot speak in Dutch. I'm sorry. No. Although I'm Belgian, uh, uh, but of course I mean, but state is very weak in Laos. That's something. I mean, the state is very weak. So NGO, I mean, contribute a lot to uh, 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 the development of uh, campaigns. I mean, sex, campaigns about sexuality, etc. Uh, it is mostly driven by NGOs and and yeah. I have no idea. But I haven't investigated this question at all. That's a very interesting point. But I, I have to say, I've, I haven't investigated this question at all. So I have no idea. I have no idea if uh, uh, people doesn't like to get tested or uh, no idea. But that's something I should clearly investigate. Clearly, yeah. Uh, nobody. I mean, if a monk is, is, is sick, he's sent to the hospital. But no, they there's no, there's no traditional, well, there is no uh, connection anymore between monasteries and healthcare in Europe, I think. A little, but that was introduced a uh, generation or two ago. Also, in Belgium. do monasteries provide healthcare for others? Did they? N uh, no healthcare. No. Healthcare. But divina divination, you can go in. No tradition. No. They don't. No. They never did. That I don't know. But they don't today. They don't yeah. today. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? Thank you very much for your lecture. I think it was quite communicated. Sorry for my accent. Yeah, but I don't know how to do it. If, if you have any tips. <laughs> yeah. But I had a very hard time negotiating my positionality, my positionality in the field. I mean, it was very hard uh, because obviously most of the time I was uh, treated as another gay tourist in some gay bars. And, and, and some of my law friends would also be shocked that I, I could hang out at night, you know, in the, in the bowling or, or because those spaces are only frequented by people who go out at night and which by most law is seen as somehow problematic. So I had a very hard time to negotiate my positionality. I, um, uh, one option would, I mean, that's what Chris Littleton did when he conducted field work in, 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 in Vincennes, is that he created a team of, of around him with, uh, you know, Lao Gay, uh, Gay uh, Kater, and, and to work all together, because I don't think I could do that on my own. There's no way I could... Uh, do you have any tips? That would be very... Uh, well, no, I don't have any tips, but, but, I, but I still you raise questions. And uh, so, so please, if you have a question, uh, I also can imagine you can describe... Do I describe... Uh, 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 traditional uh, uh, traditional uh, sexual uh, sexuality. You say it's 
are invisible um, to these to these uh, self claims, uh, these kind of sometimes characterized self. Uh, the, the gay people who come from cultures where uh, gay culture is very glorified. Mm -hmm. but do they become? Do they say, okay, uh, we adapt to the traditional sexuality. We come closer to, to this. You mean the experts, like the expatriates, yeah, yeah. living there? Because it seems such a one-directional communication, mm. as if you are kind of juggernauts. Yeah, uh, yeah. But that's the way it, it, uh, that's an interesting question, but th that's the way it, it is being described by expats, as, as, uh, um, Sort of an orientalist fantasy, you bet. Yeah. Yeah, very much, orientalist fantasy, very, very much. And... Uh, but I want, to, I want to ask something which I think follows a little bit from Matthias's uh, uh, question, and that's when, as you were speaking, I was, um, in fact, we've been hearing a lot recently about sort of the, 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 the power of the internet uh, mm. in the Uganda case, for example, mm. um, uh, Joseph Massad's uh, new very controversial book, uh, Desiring Arabs, mm. um, of, of the power of NGOs slash internet slash uh, mm. this sort of global circulation mm. of identity formation, yeah. um, including HIV uh, prevention, which um, sort of, you know, is intent on sort of making people come out and making people uh, become less visible and, uh, um, and, and, and for issues like sexuality to become explicit, mm. you know, that because that is good. Uh, when things are out in the open, mm. um, and the backlash that uh, that uh, also takes place, uh, uh, witness as it myself. My, my question is, is a specific aspect of this, namely, do young peasants from the countryside, for mm. example, also log on to these websites or read these texts and say, "Hey, there is something for me." If it's not a couple of dollars, it's, mm. you know. Yeah, uh, no, that's a very interesting question. And clearly, pornography circulates a lot, and gay pornography circulates a lot. I mean, on cell phones and, uh, and, and on the Internet in Lampre Bang. And, uh, uh, okay, and there is something about also uh, your self-perception eschatory. Uh, in a way that um, uh, 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 chatting with uh, effeminate tran uh, transvestites, for instance, I, I had this very interesting discussion about the fact that they told me that traditionally, Kateri, those Kateri, like so in, the, in the restricted sense of the, of the word, uh, when, when they have sex with a, uh, with a friend or with a client or whatever, should never display desire. They shouldn't, you know, they should give pleasure to their partner, but they shouldn't display their own desires. But, but by watching gay porn, they are facing a different way of, you know, experiencing male-to-male -male sexuality, men -to -men sexuality, and so clearly the circulation of, you know, uh, sexually explicit material contribute to a kind of reflexive stance on what is my sexuality. That's obvious in Lampre Bang. Uh, chatting, chatting with Carreu and, uh, uh, yeah, made it clear. And th there would be something to be investigated about more traditional forms of se sexuality being influenced by do these new media and, and and yeah, yeah, and the encounter with the foreign tourists and etc. Yeah. Yeah. Let's give a chance to back. Go ahead. Um, yeah. Uh, I have a question about, about your, your um, the UNESCOization on one hand, the rise of tourism, mm. and this. Yeah. Um, um, UNESCO has led to um, a rise of tourism. That's basically what, what you say, right? Yeah. According to, I think they're quite uh, logical. But then, um, if people say in town that UNESCO um, sort of you know, made all these people when they're gay or yeah, yeah. attracted all these people, yeah. how, um, how does that relate then to this whole, well, basically, to the thing you say? Um, so, so basically, my question, um, this is my question to the story you make, it, it, it makes it sound
sound like UNESCO is actually doing this, um, and, and how much of it is actually true, and, and completely simply, well, is it actually, you know, and that actually links to your question as now, the, the whole point of presenting it to the truth, that should happen, and you know, bring it out in the open, does UNESCO do anything about that, or is it just the heritage, which then, you know, sets in, in uh, sets the whole process, uh, uh, starts that process? I think there, here there is a mixture of fantasy and, 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 and also, I mean, and, and, and reality on the side of the locals. I mean, uh, the way they perceive UNESCO, it's not only about sexuality, but they clearly uh, see the advent of UNESCO as, as something somehow disruptive to their life. So they, there is a rhetoric uh, recognizing the, the, I mean, the great things made by UNESCO, but at, at the other hand, this fear rooted in post-colonial imagination. You see, the French... They have a long history with the French, and most of the UNESCO architects are French too. So clearly, uh, they see, I mean, this presence of the French in town as something ambiguous, and they love them, but there is also something about all the disruptive uh, things brought about by the French. Um, uh, but I think that UNES what UNESCO does too, it's an, a, I mean, you can take many examples outside of Laos, in many post-colonial, I mean, countries, or post-war situations, UNESCO, what UNESCO does is sex and drug also. Because clearly, UNESCO in many instances opens up, I mean, a city or region to tourism, and tourism brings drug and, 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 and or make it pro produce a proliferation of it. It doesn't create it from nothing. But clearly, you have many Thai, I mean, many Israeli, Thai, uh, uh, American tourists now flying to Laos to smoke opium, and uh, uh, I mean, people have been smoking opium for many years and, and uh, centuries uh, in, in, in the area. But clearly, UNESCO, and that's the paradox of UNESCOization, because it wants to preserve on the one hand, but it, it's also globalization. I mean, it's, it, this is what UNESCO does. It is. So, I, I mean, this is, this is one, of, that's what one of my colleagues told me once about UNESCO produce sex and drugs, but I think it's, I mean, it's a French colleague, he told me, yeah, that's what UNESCO does too, and it's true in a way, that we always see the side of UNESCO, you know, the patrimonial consecration, uh, it, it will create a flow of tourists, it will be extremely, I mean, good for the, for the area, but we also forget that it contributes to the proliferation of, of other things. This, side effects of UNESCOization. Okay, uh, you clearly mentioned that kind of contradiction between the acceptance of local people and also uh, promoting the area as a very nice destination. Do you come across with the government reflection of how the acceptance within the national level saying that we want to promote this area as a very nice destination comparing some areas in Africa that are being promoted in their area as a destination? Yeah, in Laos, totally silent, and even I mean, uh, no, the government is pretty is pretty tough. On, for instance, the uh, the Cop Thai bar, I, I was told that in the past the Cop Thai bar would mention that it was a gay spot, but he, they had to they had to withdraw it, and you cannot. I mean, it's clearly not sold as a gay destination by the authorities. Whilst if you read this uh, text about uh, Cambodia. Uh, and Angkor, they said that the king himself is promoting Angkor as a possible gay haven, and there is clearly a political support, but also like places in, uh, I, I was reading this article about C uh, Cape Town in South Africa, uh, uh, where one area is clearly promoted by the government as a hi historically gay area, gay neighborhood. That is absolutely not the case in Lom Prabang. It's n not at all. Uh, it, it, it's clearly an example of, 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 of silence, sexual silence, and, and government is totally silent about it, except when it, if it becomes too visible and it, and it will try to make it less visible. Yeah. Yeah. That's what they say. Investigate. Yeah, investigate that a little bit yeah. deeper. Yeah. And um, because one doesn't really associate Buddhism that much with being anti sex and anti, you know, I guess, being gay. Um, and I wonder within the institution that is, you know, it's a 
tolerated, they know people are coming in and out, or what are the sort of institutional structures that, uh, I mean, I don't think it's functioning like the Catholic Church and, you know, kicking people out there aren't celebrating mm. Yeah, clearly. I, 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 I don't know. It's also a very sensitive issue to investigate. I mean, uh, uh, but uh, we can think that monks have, I mean, they have also a sexuality, although theoretically they should be abstinent. We can think of that, clearly, yeah. Uh, but the thing is that uh, most, I mean, monkhood is also thought as a phase. I mean, it's only a phase of your life. You can enter into monkhood for you know, three weeks sometimes, or for one year or two years, and then you go back to ordinary life. So uh, it doesn't mean that they engage for sexual abstinence all their life. It's, all, it's only a very... And that might be more punished than if they... Mm. Are yeah. I don't know. But it's a in clearly interesting entry. I have no idea, it's my first time in Amsterdam. <laughs> let me experience it, let, let me experience it, and then we'll, then we'll talk. <laughs> yeah, but I think this notion... <laughs> I, I think the, the, the notion of gay paradise is, is interesting in itself, and, and the reference to gay paradise, uh, the idea that um, it's a place where you can feel comfortable with your identity, your sexual identity, and also you can export that. And, uh, so, and it's fed by Orientalist also uh, um, representations. I think this notion of gay paradise is a very interesting one that I should clearly explore more in Laos. And, and also how it emerges, how, you know, what makes, what are the different factors that you need to make a gay paradise? Yeah, um, yeah. the minimal in ingredients possibly. for uh, a, 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 a gay paradise to be a paradise, yeah. <laughs> yeah. First to be gay. And yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the question is, is uh, Juan Krabach already uh, developing policies in, in policing sex tourism, or maybe even over-policing? I think in Cambodia or in, or in Thailand, there were, very, uh, in, there were several examples that say are over-policing. And I know here at the airport in Skittle, we have officers um, profiling visitors from the Far East. Oh. I haven't heard anything about that in Laos. I mean, I, I, I haven't heard anything. It seems to be extremely free in terms of... Uh, I haven't heard anything, I mean, in terms of the government enforcing. Um, but... Yeah. And for what 
I hear yeah, yeah, you it, say about the Lao government, that naming is extremely yeah, problematic. Is that, yeah, because, I mean, Luang Prabang is a very complex city in the terms of the history of the nation, because it's, it's the city, it's a former royal city, uh, and the king was dethroned in, in, the, in 75, and it became a damned town. And, and, and already UNESCO, by its recognition, is contributing to a, a consecration of this royal past, you know, for a city which has been uh, damned for, for two decades by the social, sh socialist government. Damned. 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 Okay. Yeah. Damned. Okay. Uh, <laughs> And, and uh, uh, I mean, so the idea of recognizing on top of that the gay paradise seems to be totally, I mean, already it's a very specific city in the history of the nation. It's a very, uh, with a very traumatic history. So, uh, um, uh, but I wanted to say something about, uh, one hears a lot, I mean, I didn't hear anything about uh, the gay paradise being controlled by the go by government or the police or whatever, but you hear lots of stories uh, about um, forbidden relationship between Lao girls and Westerners, which is forbidden by the government. You cannot date a Lao woman as a man, as, as a foreign man. Because it's a minor age, or is it? No, no, you cannot. You may not. It's forbidden unless you marry her. So m marriage is a condition to have, you know, a relationship between a Lao and a foreigner. And, and you hear lots of stories about uh, uh, Falang who are being caught by the police and, and, and the girl sent to jail and they have to pay a lot of money for, to get the girl out and, and, and like 500 euros to the police. So the police is strictly um, uh, checking the relationship between Foreigners and, and low women, clearly. This is I, I heard so many stories like this that. Is when they have s sex, yeah. I mean, they can go out. You can go, you can you know, walk hands in the street, but if you are being caught in a guest house, that's, that's very bad for you and for her. Yeah. Clearly, and there is also female prostitution. I mean, and Lao men go to female prostitutes. Uh, you have brothels all around, I mean, Luang Prabang. Um, uh, um, but this gay paradise seems so free because it connects tourists, gay expatriates, and, and uh, it seems that the relationship between men and men are so much freer than between men and women. Th that's what struck me when doing field work in Laos. It's relationship between men are, I mean, you can get into your room with a man and with a friend, and it's a friend, it's a, you know, comrade. You just go in the room, you drink beer, and you have sex, maybe. But if you go back home with a girl, that will be like a big story. I mean, all the neighbors will say, oh, I saw David entering his room with a girl, or not only David, a, a, a Lao man he entered home with a girl, and that's an issue. And I remember stories of, um, uh, of, I mean, this French guy, gay guy, who told me, you know, almost every night I come back home with a friend, a male friend, and I, my neighbor never said anything. But once I came back home with a girl, and the neighbor, they came to me the next day and they say, you should never bring a, a, a loud girl back home. It's very bad for your reputation, and you might end up with the police. Although he had been bringing men all the time. So I think that you have different types of relationships. Men to men are different than... Women to men, in Luang Prabang, clearly, yeah. Uh, do you think the combination of uh, not being able to have the male-female relationship, platonic relationships, and all the tourism is generally the cause for uh, it becoming gay paradise? I'm inclined to think that, but I, I don't know. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't go so far. I don't know. I don't... I, uh, it's a little bit simplistic to say that because, and I don't know, I don't know. Yeah, yeah.
Uh, no, I mean, the, uh, there is a, I mean, the, many texts and many colonial texts do refer to the existence of Katoy, I mean, long time ago in, 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 in Luang Prabang, and many, many, I mean, colonizers do, do wrote about, do write about, uh, uh, about that, but I mean, I, I, when chatting with, with monks and with local people, they never mentioned the fact that Buddhism would be more open, you know, to sexual diversity. They never mentioned those kind of discourse. Most of the time, they are very homophobic. Their discourse is very homophobic. And uh, when I, then I read scholars writing about, you know, uh, Buddhism being uh, uh, so tolerant with, uh, with, uh, with homosexuality. It's, it's I have a problem with that. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. That's what people say. I, I didn't try. Oh. I'm sorry. That's also my, my issue about participant observation. I'm really annoyed with that. <laughs> no, no. I no. I went. I, no. Sorry. It's so annoying. He's a straight boy. Yeah, yeah. He tries to look gay, but he. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, clearly, but, uh, but uh, how do you want me to approach, I mean, well, I, I dorms, know. university dorms? Yeah. It's only, I mean, uh, yeah. it's only discourses I've, I've heard. I mean, yeah. my friends telling me about stories, and so it's, 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 it's all, always second-hand information. That's very annoying. Absolutely. That's why I feel so uncomfortable speaking about it also, uh, I mean, as, a, as, as an anthropologist, because it's not me experiencing. Yeah. That's very annoying. Yeah. Did you, did you yeah. Some experience online as well? I mean, you can find so many. I mean, posts online, and I mean, that, I mean, these are really interesting resources to investigate. Clearly, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then looking for men. Yeah, but mostly foreigners. Foreigners. I mean, those websites connect foreigners, uh, to gay tourists, with locals, and and um, you can learn a lot about that, yeah. but but not about. I mean. Casual encounters between men, Lao men in Laos. That's something. It's very hard to, yeah, to, to get information about that. Right, yeah. I'm sympathetic with everyone, even with UNESCO experts. Uh, I, do you tell them? I tell them, you tell them, but they don't listen. UNESCO people never listen to what <laughs> anthropologists do say, so, uh, uh, or they rarely listen. Or they say, yeah, I, I listen, but then immediately they forget what you have said. Uh, so, they know, they, they know the effects Interestingly, UNESCO experts always uh, uh, define UNESCO as harmless. They always describe the institution a, as something totally innocuous. Totally. And they say, we have no power. UNESCO has no power. There is a discourse. It's a very bureaucratic discourse about the fact that they have no power. And if... Totally. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Totally. They have an outrageous life. Outrageous life. Yeah, yeah. Right? Their life is. Absolutely. Right. Outrageous life. They are completely part of it. Yeah, uh, even the nice, nicer restaurants in yeah, yeah, yeah. Where the backpackers are eating, you know, the, the local backpacker restaurant. No, I have to say, I have to say, I, 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 was, I was trying to be. Uh, uh, b b but I don't really like the UNESCO experts. But. Uh, 
it's critical, it's critical, but it's very easy to criticize UNESCO also. So I'm try it's very easy. I mean, anthropologists have spent their, their time criticizing UNESCO, and, and uh, it's very easy to, to load a very strong bow at UNESCO uh, and to adopt this critical sociology position. I think we should be more... Uh, Yeah. But I, I, don't, I don't know if you condone sex tourism because I think it's sex, you know, like it doesn't matter if people, sex is a private matter, right? And it's always been a private matter in Asia. But building it all up because of travel, I think it's, I, I cannot condone it. It doesn't matter if it's a man with a man or a woman with a man. The whole, the whole idea of sex tourism, I think it's quite horrible. It should be something spontaneous, right? It's not organized tourism, sex tourism, and condoned by organizations like UNESCO from the UN. Well, this is nonsense. The, I think maybe the problem is that you, you keep mentioning this, uh, using this verb condoning, mm -hmm. uh, but this is not the purpose of this kind of work. It's not to either condemn or condone. No, but if you do a research, you should do something with this research. What are you going to do with it? All you mean something research? practical? Yes. Okay. But we do write articles. We do write papers. <laughs> I do something. Uh, how long did you? How long were you? For one year. I was for one year in uh, in in Lampang, and. Uh, and yeah, I'm, I, I, I almost got married, uh, so... Uh, no, because when you mentioned earlier, you had spent two weeks, so I didn't... No, no, I had been for two weeks. I had been for two weeks when I first m met those two ladyboys, and yeah. yeah. But uh, clearly, we do, I mean, we do write articles, we write paper about the, the, the effects of UNESCOization. That's, that's, that's what we do. And, and, but on the other hand, uh, I mean, I'm... Uh, two weeks ago or three weeks ago, there was an article in, in, in the French uh, journal Le Monde about Luang Prabang, and that was such a nostalgic discourse about Luang Prabang as a paradise being destroyed, not a gay paradise, but a paradise being destroyed by globalization, tourism, uh, and, uh, and uh, um, I felt that as anthropologists, we have, I mean, to be more cautious and uh, somehow get out of this nostalgia for those lost paradise. And Luang Prabang is so, so much described as a lost paradise. I mean, uh, so I wrote an answer to that at Le Monde, which was refused uh, because it's too anthropological. Uh, and, and, uh, um, uh, and on the other hand, UNESCO experts are interviewed in big journals like the Washington Post or New York Times and one of those UNESCO, French UNESCO experts working in Lampre Bank, he has been there for 10 years, and he wrote outrageously that to, keep, to preserve heritage, you, you need to keep people poor. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And so this is being published, and when anthropologists do react and say that people want more tourists, they want, uh, they want planes and more tourists, that is not being published. So there is also some kind of uh, regime de pouvoir in terms of uh, uh, anthropological knowledge. And what about yourself? You spent a whole year, you married a Laotian girl. Yeah. After you do your study. Yeah, but it's not done, I'm just starting. Yeah, when you finish with Laos, you just go off to another place and you know, do your investigation there. No, no, because. Yeah, I understand your critique, but totally. But I don't consider people as insects. I treat. I'm a sad. Oi. No. Um, the rise of such 
anyway, through all these global contexts, uh, you can see a new constru construction of new identities mm. that can be very um, um, well, dangerous or in this maybe work for traditional identities like the category. Mm. Uh, that's what Mas Masa Masad is. These people have to choose. Mm. Yeah, yeah, sure. That's in, no, that's fascinating. I, I exactly what I mean. I, I mean, to answer to to Madame, uh, when I started my research, uh, I. I clearly wanted to see what UNESCO does in terms, I mean, very, the very performative dimension of UNESCO. What UNESCO does when it recognizes a site, what happens in terms of, I mean, what are the social, economic, political, religious implications of UNESCOization? That was, the pre I mean, these were the premises of my work when I started there. And then I realized that among the, the varied effects of UNESCOization, there is also the production of this gay paradise, prostitutional arena, that's also, and uh, I, I, maybe some UNESCO experts will read that, but I'm, 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 I'm not sure. And uh, when I met a UNESCO expert in Paris uh, one or two years ago, when we spoke about Luan Prabang, he said, uh, maybe we should start wondering why UNESCO is not so well treated in Laos, and why people don't like that much UNESCO. And we should start thinking about the effects of what we do, which I found outrageous, that you can launch you know, heritage policies without even thinking about the effects of what you're doing, the, the consequences of, of the responsibilities of your policies. And, and then he, he, he concluded the talk by saying, yeah, maybe Luang Prabang is a failure, but always with maybe, maybe, oh, we don't know. Maybe we should ask people what they think. And I thought, wow, if that's UNESCO, that's scary. Because it means that uh, uh, the way they behave is very standardized and they produce policies, but they don't think about the consequences of what they do. But... What about here? People who work for the UNESCO, yeah. the Laotians, they don't give anything back to their bosses. Uh, they do, but I mean... Uh, when you speak with Lao architects in the Heritage House, they say, we don't have a say here, it's only French people. Yeah, it is. It is. But that's what Lao people say, it's colonialism. Yeah. But what's interesting is that colonialism is, is not one thing, it's not one homogenous factor. Yeah. And part of, the, part of the interest that I have in this work, for example, having listened to David, is to try to understand what colonialism consists of, yeah. so that I don't stop with the with the remark, oh, colonialism once again. I say, oh, colonialism, but under what shape? Exactly. In what forms? With whom? Against whom? Uh, involving what? Uh, tools, etc. So this is the purpose of this work, to answer your question. No, and much better say that I could do. So <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> something, if I may. I do want to add something, if I may, in answer to your... Uh, the kind of anthropological work that David and I... Uh, involved with is not the kind of work that you describe, namely just uh, going from one place, having fun, writing a few papers, and then moving on. No. Uh, one forms uh, relationships that are extremely serious in yeah. one's life. Uh, I'm old enough to have had relationships with people uh, in the places where I work, not Laos, uh, for 30 years, and I still maintain them, and these are nurtured by uh, very serious, material, emotional, uh, other forms of symbolic uh, ties. Uh, these are not just, you know, a butterfly uh, going from flower to flower. This is much more serious work. Yeah. I think it's unfair to, to accuse us of being, again, colonialist when doing anthropology, because clearly... No, but I can feel that under your argument. Uh, I'm, just your, I'm just saying that perhaps when you do more research, maybe you should interview more local people, Laos people, and incorporate all their thoughts and feelings into... That's what we do. That's what we do. That's what we do. So we try to understand the colonial, the colonialists, as well as the colonists.
Yes. Yeah. And then everything in between. And there is a, a clear tendency among anthropologists to be more on the side of the locals than on the side of tourists or experts. And clearly, uh, historically, huh, we are clearly on the side of locals. So I suggest you interview Madame later. Voilà. And, uh, that we, uh, end here. And thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.